Um, so that there, so maybe I'll start the discussion with just listening to the, the two, um, the, the give and take. It struck me that a lot of what you're doing in your lab, I mean, normally in clinical medicine, if one is sending out for a test, and I'm going to be simplistic and sort of bend this into sort of esoteric testing. You, know, you send out a test, and the lab doesn't machinate over this the way you do. They send it back, and then you 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 consult an expert, you know, another you know clinician, hopefully a local clinician expert, or you may even refer the patient to that expert uh, to sort of go through this. And it seems like there's a lot uh, that that is kind of being dumped on you in terms of going and looking up the primary data and figuring out why. Some other lab, you know, had a different interpretation, and so I guess it it it, it throws out a question of is there a, um, a a different approach that that maybe Caesar could catalyze research on around different ways to handle the dissemination and and uh, in sort of um, administration of this kind of test that doesn't sort of rely so much on the labs because yes, over time we obviously need to have databases that are accurate, but we all recognize that this is still a rapidly evolving field, and so maybe there's more of a balance for um, consultation that's not so heavily in the central. I, I was just going to throw that out there as one thought, but maybe that's maybe there are other other questions as well. Heidi. So I, I think that you know one of the things, particularly as we've all gotten it into exome sequencing and genome sequencing, you simply can't interpret an exome or genome without clinical phenotype. And I think one of the challenges that many of the laboratories have had has been the notion that you just send the DNA and out will come an answer. Um, <laughs> and you know, without a phenotype, that can be challenging. And in fact, I think the phenotype can help build and inform the interpretation. So I think thinking about better ways to have that be a, you know, a dynamic process. You know, I, and I often hear of physicians who get clinical lab reports, and you know, I think Gail made a comment, get a lab report back, I disagree with it. But if they don't go back and tell the lab why they disagree and provide that information, there's not that ability to iterate over time. And so I think it is, and I, I have seen that happen within CSER. I, th I think it's a great environment that CSER has where there's a dynamic between the laboratory and the clinicians that's informing this over time, and I think that's been a great example. And, and I would actually argue, getting back to the you know, original Bake Off project that we've been doing, although we are seeing differences in the implementation of the guidelines across groups, having watched CSER evolve over the past four years, the groups have really developed and improved and learned how to interpret variants in a more sophisticated way than the start of the project. And I would argue that our ACMG guidelines right now are a bit dealing with another area of laboratories that are just still reporting variants as pathogenic because somebody published them as such. And, and I think we've managed to get sort of that really poor environment addressed, and, and I think that guidelines help with that. And now we're sort of looking at the implementation in a more expert environment, which I think CSER represents. And now we're in a next phase of, okay, how do we move another tier up and improve the quantitation? And Gail pointed out that, you know, some of the things that we're starting to think about to make these guide guidelines more objective and less subjective. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll add to that that it has been very simple for a lot of these rules to come to a general agreement about how they should be used, even though we came in maybe using them differently, but to agree on a framework of what was, what was the intention of the rule. Sometimes the literal wording of the rule is a little bit uh, misleading, and so we have been able to reach consensus about what these rules means. So I think feeding back to the community then about what is a consensus interpretation of the rule is going to be a really important step forward. And uh, Heidi, you can bet when I don't agree with someone's lab report, they hear from me. <laughs> Let's go over to the other side of the room, Pilar. Oh, thank you. Um, so I had a question for either of the speakers or anybody else in the room. Um, do you see differences with respect to sort of the field um, that are ordering tests, so the clinical domain in which the test is being ordered. Um, do you see differences in different clinical domains with how the ACMG recommendations are being interpreted or how um, sort of at home 
rules for uh, calling variants are operating. And I ask this question because I, I'm not a clinician, but I consult with uh, some clinical labs and some clinician researchers. And I feel like I see differences in the amount of evidence that different fields of medicine require before they would call something um, a pathogenic variant or not. And I'm wondering if, if the medical practice in genetics is creeping into the laboratory practice. Um, I, I would say yes, potentially. And um, in, in doing these ACM GAMP guidelines, our goal was to try to do it across the board for any gene and you know, acknowledging that we need to get into more disease specific. Um, I have, we do get a lot of genetic testing from non-specialists. Um, the ones that seem to, to uh, work better with what genetic information is, neurologists seem to know it extremely well, obviously clinical geneticists. Um, when you get into more primary care physicians is when they, they are going to rely more on the laboratory um, than what some of the specialists will be doing. But um, I, I do agree that it really is going to depend on the condition and what the other genes are and a whole bunch of different parameters of how strongly I will um, feel about calling something pathogenic versus likely. And I also, I, you know, talking with our clinical geneticists, I was surprised that for some conditions, hey, you know, if you can give me 30 to 1 odds, I'm going to take it. Another one was saying, no, I've got to have 100 to 1 odds before I do. So um, it, it, there's a lot of variability there, and I will let Gail continue. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's been a novel thing in medical genetics in the last five years that we are reinterpreting the variants at, clinically. You know, in 10 years ago, if they said it was a pathogenic BRCA mutation, I took their word for it. Um, and we're in a different phase now where so much less is known about the very rare variants we're finding on these exome and genome tests. There's very little evidence base, and there is such variability among what the labs call that you have to actually look at the primary data. And we've had to retrain even not just our medical geneticists, but our genetic counselors, you know, now can get on XAC and look up the allele frequency. And we, uh, one of the things we also feed back to labs is when they don't give us enough information in the report. So there's certainly one lab that just says, this is what we're calling it. We're not telling you why. And we try and avoid that lab for, you know, because we want to know why they called it that way to see if we agree with that reason. And it's the same thing as for what goes into ClinVar. You want to not just see what they called it, but why they called it. But realistically, medical geneticists loses money because we spend like an hour with every patient. We spend an hour in prep time. We can't really spend a half hour of prep time looking up all the evidence for the variant, and sometimes it's four or five hours to really go through the literature for every patient. We, that really needs to go to the lab, and we need to be confident about the results that we're getting, but we're not there yet. But we can't continue as a practice without fixing that. You want? So um, some part of this, I think, is, are, you know, are we ready for, for prime time? And I, I don't know, when I look at the results of the, the Bake Off, I don't know whether to, to, to laugh or, or cry. Um, obviously, we would all want it to be, what, what want those result, results to be better. But then another part of me thinks, are we holding ourselves as geneticists to a higher standard than the rest of clinical medicine? Because I also practice in cardiology, and we do echoes, and that's been very established for 30 years. And I regularly, like every day in clinic, get sent echo reports that I don't agree with. And so I also wondered, really, it's a question of timing. At what point are we, are we ready to, to, to unleash this and just be comfortable with the uncertainty? Yeah, so I actually do the QC for the carotid ultrasounds, and there people disagree by one classification commonly, right? And that's like considered just fine, um, and there's only four categories for that. So, um, so I think that we that it is important to say we're not going to match all the time. Maybe the goal isn't to match all the time, but the goal certainly is to have a set of useful criteria that we in, that we all apply in the same way. And I think that's where we're trying to get not to total agreement, but to use the right criteria in the same way. Or right, we had a question back in the corner here. Yeah, Bob Nussbaum. I actually had three comments to make. I think one problem is that talking about a one step 
doesn't really help that much because the step between pathogenic and likely pathogenic is not the same as the step between likely pathogenic and VUS. Whereas if you have great gradations of your carotid um, and uh, d degree, it, it's just a different, uh, it's just a different uh, quality. And, and, and I think overcoming that is really one of the major, major challenges. The second comment had to do with about that Levi, you raised about consulting with the laboratory. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the vast majority of genetic testing these days is not coming from academic centers. It's coming from, for example, in the cancer world particularly, it's coming from private oncology and even more so private GYN and oncologists. That's where the vast majority of market share for the company that shall not be named is coming from. And so um, uh, they, those practitioners have to have some expert to call and talk to. And, and, and I can't think of any, anyone who could do a better job of interpreting their result to the patient than the lab, uh, to the practitioner than the lab that generated the result. So I, I don't think we're going to get away from that until the level of education of non-specialists uh, rises. And then the last point I wanted to make had to do with are, are there different practices among different practitioners? And, and, and I think it's inescapable because in many ways the interpretation of a variant, although this is cert to some extent is circular, is also highly Bayesian. So if you have a patient who has a, 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 an obvious CNS abnormality and a molar tooth sign and has Joubert syndrome and you have a typical um, gene that's involved with a variant that maybe it's not quite clear if it's a, if it's a variant of uncertain significance or likely pathogenic, that's going to be looked at differently than when you have a disorder where there's a very high prior probability that it's actually not an hereditary disorder at all. Sharon. Well, I guess to go back to Eric's comment earlier, I, I think it's been a fascinating discussion, but maybe in the wrap-up, people could say, well, what is Caesar 2.0 going to do about this problem? Is it the question of improving the guidelines or better consistency or facilitating ways for clinicians to communicate back to labs? Because I agree with you. I think the Caesar sites all communicate with their labs actively, but like, how are we going to help solve this problem in the next So, Sharon, phase? you're setting up Deborah's closing remark, which is great. But there was one more question in the back, and then we'll go to, to, to the closing remarks. Naomi Aronson, Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. I'm very impressed with the quote, one gene at a time, one variant at a time with careful investigation. But there's also a contrast to what's being seen commercially, as health plans were encountering this frequently. And that is very heavy marketing of profiling and paneling in certain clinical areas, but not confined just to oncology, very broadly. And it's, it's actually the existing of sequencing itself that makes this uh, feasible to offer. These are going directly to uh, the clinician, perhaps are even more attractive because they come with the interpretation all rolled up. But my real question is, how will a CSER ap approach this question beyond one gene at a time and sequencing to what is the relationship, the uh, algorithms, the proposed algorithms? And there is something very concerning here, too, because there can be different panels of tests, different profiles that come out with sort of the same predictive capability, but not necessarily selecting the same patients. You can think of a positive explanation for this. Maybe the target is broad enough to accommodate this. Or a negative e explanation. Maybe there's just a lot of air here. But it does, I think, force us to start thinking about the interactions. And I just wanted to raise that question. I, I would um, direct you to Carlos Gallagos' uh, paper from CSER, which is on what is the optimal size cancer panel, what kinds of genes, what number of genes. Uh, it was a really nice uh, work that David Veenstra here is the senior author on. Um, and that kind of outcomes work, I think we're going to have an outcome session later, is critically important and a very important space for CSER, I would agree. 
All right, well, that was a, a great discussion. So now I think it's time for the closing remarks by Deborah.